That's right. We have gotten together in the field, me, you, and Brad, and mm-hmm. we um, uh, both played a role in Graham, um, Graham Hancock's recent book. Yep. And we had to go to Wilmington, North Carolina, and had an interesting little scientific session there, to say the least. To that say the least. Controversial, came a little controversial, but I think instructive. Uh, about how with even our own community, there can be fractures b- between what people believe, our right. own community being catastrophists. Right. But it's a big subject with not enough information, and we're all entitled to disagree. I think uh, you and I are uh, probably a little bit more on the speculative side, you even more perhaps than I am. But I can explain the perspective I come from and how I got into this debate uh, whenever you'd like me to. Yeah, well, we definitely need to go there. A- absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think that it would be good to go back to that 2007 paper because yeah. I didn't know you when that paper came out, but I can still remember how excited I got when yeah. that paper showed up in the scientific press. It was almost like, well, Brad will testify to this because we had been talking about this together for, well, close to 10 years, literally. Right. I know you, you know. Had. So, know you. so, so yeah, and, and, you know, pulling these kind of more, more tentative strands together to come to right. this conclusion and then suddenly here's scientific vindication but what kind of came as a shock to me I guess was the was the response to it that you've mentioned and I think that that's yeah because it almost seemed like there was a I wouldn't even know I would say almost an irrational response to it like there was a faction that just didn't want to even consider or go there as a possibility and immediately began to invoke whatever explanation could seem to offer an alternative to the idea of something from space hitting the earth. So it's in it. Yeah. Well, I think what you welcomed in 2007 is the same thing I did having already been a catastrophist, if you will, Mm -hmm. and people can look that up. But I think the listener of this podcast might understand that some people believe that uh, earth's history, in fact, human history Mm -hmm. is punctuated by tremendous cataclysms. So that's the, the first definition of a catastrophist. Uh, you and I and Brad um, all held those views long before that 2007 paper. I was one of the lucky people out there on the internet in the 1990s, or I guess uh, the only one um, that got contacted by the original credentialed scientists Mm -hmm. who had found similar evidence that uh, had been, um, I guess, circumstantially provided by catastrophists like ourselves that followed up and actually looked and said, can we look at these soils old, well-dated archaeological soils, and that's the tremendous hack of this scientific team that I'm lucky to be part of, is they said, we're not going to argue about the dates, although that's come to be over the last 15 years, but um, most of the dates of the original sites are indisputable, that they'd already been well-published by other scientists for the last 50 years, like Murray Springs and Blackwater Mm -hmm. Draw and places like that. So what the Comet Research Group did prior to 2007, which came to fruition in 2007, we said, let's go back to some of these well-dated sites that are well accepted by mainstream archaeology and other geoscientists as being a particular age, and let's look at the soils right at that band where you transition from the well-accepted dramatic change from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. We left off last episode, actually, with the black mat. Did you? That's great. because So a, that's a very a huge, that's a, a yeah. perfect point for you to pick up the narrative. Well, it is. And, and the Black Mat was the place where perhaps uh, mankind picked up its narrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was a profound, profound transition, even according to mainstream scientists. That's what's so mm-hmm. important to first know, perhaps for your viewers, um, that for at least 50, 60, I was looking the other day to see the first uh, published uh, reporting of there being a dramatic transition in kind of regular scientific literature. And I found it all the way back to 1898 Mm -hmm. where someone, a European scientist clearly has said that when I go back through the soil layers, I find something dramatic happened roughly. I don't know whether he dated it correctly because they certainly didn't have C14 dating, but he said there was a dramatic change a meter and a half down or two meters down or whatever in my local soils. And then you follow it all the way through to the well-defined Usolo soils in Europe, which started to be discovered in the 50s and 60s and set in the sand covers in uh, particularly the lowlands in the Netherlands and Belgium and and whatnot, that you can find a dramatic transition. And then bada boom, bada bang, into the 20th century, they're finding the same dramatic transition in soils in North America. And then we're able to date them. 
And then we're able to see that that's where the first human culture, I have a little show and tell the Clovis people yeah. you can see there. Mm -hmm. And that's a, not a real point though. I wish it were where the, the makers of this technology blinked out of the archeological record. Not coincidentally, that's when the large megafauna blink out of the archeological record mm -hmm. and not coincidentally, that's where we find a distinct change in the hydro hydrology and surface conditions that resulted in a black mat. I need to note the black mat itself is not like burned material that fell out of the sky. There are things like that, carbon soot, and they call it a ciniform soot, and exotic kinds of soot that they can connect with these kinds of global and regional conflagrations. But that soot actually shows itself at the bottom of the black mat. Mm -hmm. The black mat was the change in the hydrology and the climate conditions. and was basically a very, very dark time in the landscape, both from a soil perspective and from a climate perspective and from a livability perspective, if you will. And that shows it. But when they tested below that black mat, immediate below, below it, the lead authors of our papers discovered that it was enriched with proxy materials from what was apparently a extraordinarily widespread high heat, high pressure hell event that occurred very, very suddenly. And it's only after that that you don't find either the Clovis people, we've got a couple of more, the mammoth, our friend the mammoth, that's mm -hmm. a mammoth tooth. tooth. Yeah, there, there's the old, uh, had to bring in the uh, cave bear tooth. Kids love that, you know, and you... Oh, yeah. Spit it out for the tooth fairy. Give that guy a yeah. <laughs> nice. cave bear tooth. But 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 that megafauna disappears along with that first human culture. It complicates things because that human culture, as you guys well defined in earlier episodes, is implicated in uh, the demise of those fifty four genera and two hundred and fifty eight different species of animals. Somehow they chase down to the very last of two different kinds of birds and a two-ton armadillo, and ate every single one of them. Y'all have well discussed this, so we don't need to plow that ground again. But I don't think that the coincidence between this disappearing and this disappearing has, uh, is causal between the two, except uh, perhaps in a post-catastrophic situation or perhaps in bringing the populations down somewhat before the cataclysm happened. What's really at fault is this.